will begin by the Lebanese national anthem. Why city streets? What is the purpose of organizing this conference for the third time at NDU? Today, we are witnessing a fast and extensive movement touching city streets worldwide. Some animated streets offer us an opportunity for conviviality in social gatherings, a place to share our human experiences. Cities can present a core place for the development of migrant communities to show ethnic and cultural diversity in visual communication and street performances. So, a question could occur. Under what circumstances transitional streets become convivial places, such as the bustling area of Times Square in Manhattan or Montmartre in Paris, where many artists took their inspiration, like Picasso, Renoir, Matisse, to name a few, and Charles Aznavour singing La Bohème. Today, here at NDU, and up to Saturday, we need to reflect together on how transitional streets are functioning and what is happening regarding conviviality a word that we cherish in Lebanon. The conference theme is transitional streets, narrating stories of convivial streets. This conference continues to provide a platform for an international and interdisciplinary exchange of scholarship. Conference participants, distinguished guests, Father Pierre Najem, NDU president, colleagues, Ladies and gentlemen and students, good morning and welcome to the third NDU Streets Conference organized and held at the Ramaz G. Shahouri Faculty of Architecture, Arts and Design. And now I will leave the floor to Dr. Christine Modi, Chairperson of the Department of Architecture and the Department, Department of at RC FAD and chair of the CS3 organizing committee, a multitasking woman. Good morning, everyone, and apologies for the slight delay in starting today's session. Honored guests, distinguished delegates, President of NDU, Reverend Father Pierre Najem, dear NDU community, ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed a pleasure and a great honor to welcome you to the third City Street Conference held at NDU in Lebanon, where this time NDU and UN Habitat in Beirut collaborated to realize this event on no other day than the 31st of October, which is the World Cities Day. I would first like to thank Ms. Rula Majdalani, a member of the organizing committee of this conference, for her welcome address and her kind introduction of myself. As some of you already know, and some of you will find out in the coming four days, this conference series set forth the aim to focus on common concerns regarding streets across disciplines and geographies in different urban cultures, and to foster collegial ties through exchange and sharing of knowledge in an environment imbued with principles of conviviality. In relation to the third City Street Conference, I decided to narrate a short story about the conference theme 
its format and the people behind this year's event. The conference theme was influenced by the basic role of streets as conduits of flow and the overwhelming human flow the world has witnessed in the recent years. As public spaces, streets are the places of encounter in everyday life. This is where exchange and acceptance of difference or the lack of them are manifested. Reference is made to conviviality as explored by Mark Child in his book on squares. And I quote, conviviality is the vibrant sense of belonging to a settlement. As a species, we are gregarious. Convivial places support our fondness for company, unquote. And conviviality has an ethical slant with, quote, individual freedom realized in personal interdependence, unquote. Increased mobility facilitated both in physical and virtual realms and exposure to multiculturalism are swords with two edges. The opportunities and threats are explored through the various formats of this conference. The keynote speeches are meant to highlight various aspects of convivial streets. Uh, these are further elaborated in about 40 contributions within the conference tracks. In addition, four moderators will engage discussants in the three roundtables, roundtable sessions, a format that allows academics, professionals, and third parties to debate common themes related to streets and conviviality. This year's conference also includes the street photography competition and the best paper award, which will be disclosed in the closing ceremony where we will also announce the theme and the venue for City Street 4 in 2020. Delegates will also enjoy the organized social events as part of the conference. In ending this story, I need to introduce the actors. In addition to all the conference contributors in the various sessions and UN Habitat in Beirut, I would like to thank Biblos Bank, MPS, Schneider, and al Mashre Insurance and Reinsurance for their generous support. I would like to thank the faculty members from the seven faculties at NDU and faculty members from all the partner universities for diligently reviewing abstracts and papers and providing feedback to the authors of the, par of the participants, the authors who are the participants. I would also like to thank the conference advisory board members, the conference organizing committee members, for tirelessly working, and the NDU community in its various administrative offices for their constant support, thus ensuring the continuation and enhancement of this event. On behalf of the City Street 3 uh, organizing committee, I wish you an insightful conference which sustains opportunities for ongoing scholarly exchange. And thank you. We listen without further ado to the Dean of the RC FAD, Dr. Jean-Pierre Lasmar. Good morning. Distinguished guests, Father Pierre Najem and you, President, administrators, distinguished delegates, colleagues, and students, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the opening ceremony of the City Street Conference for its third version, organized by the Ramesh Shahouri Faculty of Architecture, Art and Design, in collaboration with the other six faculties at NDU and more than 10 partner universities from North America, Europe, Asia, North Africa, and Lebanon. In 2016, City Street Conference two was titled City Street, Street Forming, Reforming, and Transforming the 21st Century City Streets. Building on the successes of CS1 and CS2, CS3 is titled Transitional Streets, Narrating Stories of Convivial Streets. City streets are experiencing an unprecedented and or unorganized mass mobility of refugees and displaced people across the globe. 
with over 68.5 million displaced people, including 25.4 million refugees, according to the UNHCR Global Trends 2017, we are currently facing what has been dubbed as the largest humanitarian crisis in history. The causes vary from environmental disaster, uh, socio-political instabilities, civil wars, terrorism, and you name it. This situation requires deep reflections around how the identities of cities and their streets are transforming. These changes certainly bring forth new challenges, a necessity to adapt and swiftly re respond to social needs, but also to provide enriching opportunities to reshape our streets and find a just and convivial balance amidst a volatile and unpredictable world. The idea of conviviality refers to a certain warmth, acceptance, and liveliness, which should be reflected in the way we imagine new streets. This is why the concept is interesting to reflect upon while studying how transitional streets can address current challenges in order to create a safe, welcoming, and just environment for all. It is gratifying to note that the agenda of CS3 covers a wide range of very interesting topics relating to city streets. Research on this topic is neither bound to one discipline nor to a single context. It spans around various aspects of our everyday lives and intellectual endeavor. Uh, this conference continues to provide a platform for an international and interdisciplinary exchange of scholarship on adaptive approach towards transitional streets. It is interdisciplinary, therefore keywords from a variety of backgrounds will flow. The different tracks, the different tracks will go over communication, visualization and semiotics. Then we will also tackle issues such as the real, the virtual and the future needs. Moreover, by placing society at the heart of the functioning of city streets, some other tracks will address urban transformation, social justice, and collective memory in the way they relate to space. Accordingly, urban planners, engineers, landscape architects, and designers, in addition to philosophers, sociologists, music musician, musicians, and artists, have all addressed city streets, each within their own field. Nonetheless, also by linking and, emer and merging different realms of study. Researchers reflect various aspects of the reality of urban streets, as well as their ever-changing role in relation to people and societies. The substantial contribution of 43 participants from 18 countries in both poster and paper formats have tried to answer CS3 questions categorized in the 10 tracks. I wish to wor warmly welcome you and thank all participants from Canada, Costa Rica, Denmark, Egypt, Finland, Germany, Greece, Italy, Japan, Lebanon, of course, Macedonia, the Netherlands, Portugal, Slovenia, Spain, Sweden, the USA, and the United Kingdom. I would like to extend my gratitude to the CS3 organizing committee members, chaired by Dr. Christine Mahdi. In concluding, I wish you very successful, uh, uh, every success in your deliberation and a very pleasant stay at NDU and in Lebanon. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Asmar. Uh, at this stage, I would like to introduce the president of NDU, Father Pierre Najem, to deliver his word. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Cities, as a human productions, are the environment where our human activities take shape. They are the catalyst of political, religious, and social events. People are increasingly moving into cities, and with the increasing growth of human populations all over the world, solutions must be found. However, before solutions could be found, the problematic has to be well defined. And this is where research 
becomes crucial. For us to be able to find appropriate answers, the right questions need to be asked. Alejandro Aravena, the Chilean architect and winner of the Pritzker Prize, stated that in order to house the growing human population in cities, we will need to build a city that can house a million inhabitants every week for the next 15 years. This is a staggering number and means that we are under pressure to find solutions and hence under pressure to ask the difficult questions. This conference named City Streets aims to, explo to explore the various aspects of our built environment and the manner in which the various parts of the city interact with one another. It also explores how events and social conditions unfold along mobility networks, the pressure of the growing population on the outdated infrastructures, the lack of social space, and the visual image of the urban environment. Our university, in its efforts to ask these questions that are at the core of its mission, is organizing an event that aims to explore the various aspects of the built environments in city around the globe. In the Bible, the concept of a city is fundamental. There's a certain dialectic between the Garden of Eden as Adam's first habitat and the first city that, that was founded by Cain, escaping God's wrath after he killed his brother. Cities in the Old Testament were in general the locus of sin and rebellion against God's will. From Babel to Sodom to Gomorrah to Nineveh, Bab Babylon and Jerusalem, yet still, God's plan for man, as described in the New Testament, is one of love and one which seeks to redeem the city. The church, which is constantly described as the new Jerusalem in the New Testament, the new city of peace, is identified as the city of God, and all the streets and the paths should lead to that city. This new city is the dwelling place of God with his people. The streets that lead to it are also fundamental in the Bible because, as the Lord states, I'm the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus becomes the pathway that leads to God. In this respect, the two concepts of city and street are powerful metaphors in the Bible. I'd like to thank the committee for organizing this very important event. I'd like to thank the Dean, Chairperson, and all the team, the working team, and may all our streets lead to the new city of peace. Welcome to NDU. Thank you, Father Najam. Introducing our guest speaker, Ms. Arpin Mangasaryan, who is an urban planner. She was head of the Department of Architecture from 1993 until 2016 at the municipality of Bushhamud in Beirut. Between 2011 and 2015, she participated as a panelist in conferences and meetings organized by municipalities, universities, and institutions in Lebanon and abroad, such as l'Institut Francais du Proche-Orient and the American Institute of Architects in New York. Remarkable about Ms. Mangasaryan is her dedication to reflect in Burj Hamoud Lebanese-Armenian conviviality. Ms. Mangasaryan is the founder and director of Badger, an Armenian cultural house established in a two-story renovated building in Burj Hamoud and turned into a platform for the promotion and transmission of the Armenian cultural heritage. Join me in welcoming Ms. Mangasaryan.
thank you for the introduction. Uh, good morning, everybody, to you. And um, thank you for this uh, opportunity. Today, I am invited uh, to speak about a city as an expert who uh, had worked uh, at the Bursamot municipality for 23 years and studied the urban, social, and cultural challenges uh, of the city uh, that the city was facing and is facing. I will also speak as a user based on my experience as the founder of Badger, the Armenian cultural house for creators and artisans. So my intervention will be about Burchamut, which dates back to almost 100 years, uh, 100 years ago, as a living and working city for the Armenian population. A wetland bounded by the Mediterranean Sea and Beirut River, which within a few decades was transformed by, by the Armenian population into a popular area, an artisanal and commercial hub uh, within dense residential neighborhoods. Therefore, it became, let me see, yes. Therefore, it became a, a busting urban economic center where different productive sectors were developed, especially during the civil war, following the relocation of many businesses from Beirut to Burchamut for safety reasons. This has led to the development of a network of souks. Uh, just decades later, the city was perceived as a vibrant, attractive and warm place. It was perceived. People such as designers, researchers, sociologists, anthropologists, urban planners, tourists, photographers, and curious persons were excited to meet the creative minds and hands working and producing with great modesty in this area. They were interested in discovering the culture of the people living in this part of Lebanon, learning and sharing their hidden stories and spirit behind the facades of the city. I think. So, what are the main points of the particularity that make the old city seem welcoming to people and express a friendly atmosphere. I will permit myself to answer this question with another question. Can we find in Bushamud the following elements that city planners usually adopt for their plans as key issues for a successful and convivial uh, space or a welcoming neighborhood. Enjoyable public and common spaces for all the users, parks or gardens where people want to sit and spend time. Second, pedestrian streets or large sidewalks where uh, cars can't invite the space and disturb people in the street. Parking to provide a comfortable life. Natural landscapes or sceneries of nature integrated in the city's fabric, which makes the city a relaxing environment. Urban furniture uh, with lots of places to sit, for example, benches under trees. A pleasant built fabric of well-maintained and interesting facades. A well-elaborated zoning plan developed by planners where dogmatic criteria 
adopted thoroughly in the uh, perspective of creating convivial cities for people. These elements are practically absent in the case of Urchamut. And it returned to my initial question to point out the elements and the factors that stand behind the particular character of the city center. The densely woven and uh, rigorously orthogonal network of narrow cities, uh, streets, with mixed and uh, mixed use buildings form the only public space in the city. Uh, with the large interconnectivity, this net network represents a stage, a, uh, an arena, where various activities take place. These streets are the veins of the city, keeping it lively and vibrant. The proximity of different functions, such as residential, commercial, social, and cultural, all compacted within this network, give the city its multifunctional aspect, its attractiveness, and picturesque character. The diverse and dense activities taking place, place inside the facades of the uh, Prince level, or even in the upper floor, extend to the arena. They narrate the stories and the exper uh, ex experiences of people. They tell about the survivors of the genocide, the local community life, the cultural heritage, and the tra uh, traditions through their crafts and know-hows. They narrate to the visitors about their fate, their common struggle, their solidarity, and their challenges, creating a lively atmosphere of hospitality. The social cohesion creates a sense of security and an atmosphere uh, and an authentic, peaceful environment. The particular character of the old souks allows for a, a pleasant experience when strolling the narrow streets, when strolling the narrow streets. To be lost in the crowded neighborhood for a few hours and explore a wide variety of goods becomes a unique uh, adventure, creating a feeling of living uh, in a tale. One of the main characteristics of the city is the multicultural character, where diverse communities freely exert their traditions and cultural activities with mutual respect and tolerance, mutual tolerance. In addition, the city is equipped with, a, uh, with an extended road network, facilitating the access to and from the city. These two components are the key elements that define Burchamud as a porous and welcoming city. The human scale of the city, which is emphasized by the height of the buildings, as well as the alignment of the facades along the sidewalks, allows for uh, a warm and friendly environment. A city that offers an environment of experience, uh, alongside a functional environment as a human city. Many transformations were occurred to the city during the development. Different infrastructures, highways, and viaduct uh, uh, fragmented the urban fabric. The major elements of nature, the seashore and the river, are no more integrated to the city, where many uh, social activities were happening. 
the presence of a high number of refugees from out of the country, uh, which uh, increases the functional character of the city. So despite these factors, today Burchamud still remains a human city. With the arrival, with the arrival of a big, uh, yes, uh, uh, reflects the same human city. Now I will tell about Badger. Badger, a space that brings uh, brings uh, together people, their stories, traditions, memories, activities, and their cultural heritage related to the local Armenian culture. It is a social, socio-cultural platform which invites people to be involved in raising awareness about the, the diverse components of the city's identity. But Ger tries to inspire new breath and life for a city uh, which is getting old. He tries to make people hear the music and the sweetness of life. Let us listen to the street sound. Okay. There is a video that I can't Mm. It's pity because uh, I stayed in the street, in one of the streets, and you have it on, your desktop. Maybe yeah. you can... uh, on my desktop, yeah. no, on my uh, email. Oh, maybe uh, no there is no internet. Very, mm, very sad. So let us just. Mm, because I filmed and I uh, filmed the voices in the street where uh, the shoemakers were, were, were uh, tapotating on their leather. So the sound was uh, heard for people who were passing from the street and then uh, other workshops also. So unfortunately, I can't show. So these are extracts from these streets with the graffiti. And uh, this is the end. Thank you, Ms. Mangasarian, for portraying a true image of conviviality within our city. I can invite, thank you, I can invite you to come to Bushamud and to visit uh, this street, this street, to hear what I heard or what everybody hears during the day. Before inviting again Dr. Mahdi to introduce the conference's first keynote speaker, on behalf of all the members of the organizing committee of City Streets 3, I welcome you again, and I sincerely hope that you will enjoy the conference debates. Prepare yourselves to be challenged and inspired. Dr. Mahdi. Before being awarded the University of Alberta's Henry Marshall Tory Endowed Research Chair of Sociology, Dr. Shields was Professor of Sociology and past Director of the Institute of Interdisciplinary Studies at Carleton University, Ottawa. A Commonwealth Scholar at University of Sussex, Rob's early career was in passive solar design which he studied at Carlton University School of Architecture. 
He founded Space and Culture, an international peer re refereed journal, and Curb Canadian Planning Magazine. In 2014, he was visiting professor in architecture and planning at Teuvin, Te city of Vienna, and is currently completing research in, on nanotechnology as a space of concern. Rob Shields' work spans architecture, planning, and urban geography. He is an award-winning author and co-editor of numerous books, including, but of course not limited to, Spatial Questions, The Virtual, Lifestyle Shopping, Cultures of Internet, Le Fevre, Love and Struggle, Places on the Margin, and Building Tomorrow, Innovation in Construction and Engineering. His lecture for this conference is entitled Walking, Street Ballets, Improvised Emancipation. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Professor Robert Shields. There it is. Thank you. It's a delight to be here. Um, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to um, Beirut, to this wonderful country, and to this marvelous university. Um, I've uh, been on the plane for uh, 20 hours, so uh, I uh, uh, feel myself um, you know, not to have completely landed, uh, and so uh, I'm going to do my best to be uh, systematic uh, as I can. Um, but what I want to uh, speak to you about today is um, a vision of uh, understanding um, the street from the level of the street and uh, to try to think through some questions of, of what it would be to speak about the, the aesthetics and the ethics of the street and to understand from that the idea of emancipation uh, and the role of design professions um, and uh, architects uh, in that. Um, when I was thinking about this conference, it struck me as, as difficult because um, streets are, are so different around the world. I've been in the last, uh, in the last month in China, uh, in, uh, in Europe, um, in, uh, in Antwerp, which has marvelous uh, walking uh, spaces, almost the, the, a large section of the city center is entirely pedestrianized. Uh, in China, there is a, a, a complete redesign of, of the street taking place, uh, and yet at the same time, the old passages, the narrow alleys of the hutongs um, uh, still, still um, are the center of social life. In Bogota, Colombia, I was at a conference on uh, walking and making a walking city in a city that's really a transit city dominated by the Transmilenio uh, bus rapid transit system uh, and is hardly a walking city um, despite uh, magnificent infrastructure that of course is overwhelmed by, by a, a, a huge growing uh, rural to urban uh, migration that's taking place in Colombia. Um, and in Canada, uh, we continue to build infrastructure, but we try to separate pedestrians uh, from uh, vehicles, and this makes a very uh, structured but kind of static, um, uh, unsociable street. So I want to introduce some concepts for thinking uh, through this that I've used in some of my, my work. Uh, can, um, I have a clicker. I wondered what this was. I thought it was maybe a new kind of phone or something. <laughs> there we are. Some, some keywords. Our, the first problem, if I can stand down here, it's, it's, uh, you're a long way back, back there. So, and I assume that many of you are, are students. The first problem we have in the design professions is we have a problem of language, most notably in English. Probably the most difficult language to talk about design or social space in. You're much better if you have French or, or even Arabic. But we, we 
have an inheritance from the Latin spatium and extensio that's confused together in the word space. So in English, when you say space, it really means a void. And it's very difficult to attribute social meaning to a, a pure emptiness or to an extension, a kind of infinite expansion, uh, the three-dimensional grid work of, uh, of Descartes, which you find the minute you turn on a, a, a computer, the minute you, you, you turn on even, say, Rhino, you're looking at these, these three-dimensional grid works, and in a sense, it fights against you. You're, the entire uh, inheritance of the philosophy of space and the technology that you have available to you points, points, your, um, points your attention, directs your attention away from the conviviality, from the bustle, from the busyness of the streets. It's a shock to arrive in a country like China and discover an entire vocabulary for describing the bustle or the busyness of the streets, the renao. The, the way in which a street can be understood as successful is judged in social terms, in terms of the number of people and how busy it is. Even if for North Americans we think, oh, it's too, too overstimulating. Um, so we have this, these problems um, which uh, we've tried to compensate for by uh, learning from, from uh, German and from, in particular, French theorists over the last 50 to 60 years in English. And in translation, even if we translate l'espace into space, this space really has a, a qualitative sense. It's not a quantitative uh, term. It's a qualitative sense of, of this space. Here we are in a space together. That makes perfectly, perfect sense in French, l'espace. But if I say, here I am in a space together, we're kind of floating, you know? It tells us, uh, it, it's about a volume, right? Not about an occasion. So uh, l'espace has a sense of, of, of an event. Most recently in a book called Spatial Questions, I've tried to um, work my way out of the, the history of the philosophy of space in, to look at uh, whether we could benefit from the language, the more precise terminology of algebraic top topology. Their words for space are words like manifold in order to uh, try to have us stop thinking in three-dimensional terms and free us up so we can think of more supple um, and qualitative spaces. I've also called these social spatializations as a, to try to convey the ongoing process, this kind of constructed quality of placing and spacing things. So the audience is there and the speaker is here and they usually put me up there. Um, it's a spacing which indicates power and authority, right? So it's a social spatialization, not just a space. When we think in more, when we liberate ourselves from space and we think about the street, we think about social spaces, then we can think about those spaces in more fluid or perhaps topological terms as, as things that change, they have rhythms to them, they change through the day. Uh, and it allows us to start thinking more about the temporality, the rhythm of uh, places and about ex the role of experience in forming our understanding of place and of the street. And hence, um, I've moved a little bit to think about cultural topologies, about the, the time-space organization of the, the streets. For example, the street of a, of a religious procession versus the street of a, a market day. Uh, and to try to think about the intangible aspects that go into the streets. In architectural or design terms, what I'm suggesting is that we start to think about the street as having extra dimensions. This tradition comes from the work, uh, well, really from the architectural reception of the work of Walter Benjamin, a Frankfurt School uh, Jewish philosopher uh, of, of um, urbanism and culture in his uh, work on the arcades of Paris, which he saw as kind of the crucibles of an experience of modernity. Um, in his uh, essay, Paris, capital of the, the, the 19th century, he, he explains uh, how those um, arcades or walking uh, galeria 
of uh, Paris are a kind of a, a condensed um, sight of the experience of being in an imperial metropolis. They condense privilege, power, uh, material commodities, uh, and uh, class together. But um, an architect whose, whose name I've lost long ago, unfortunately, once just described this text as an overdimensioned glance at the arcades. Um, overdimensioned and overdimensioning, I think, is a, a, an innate concept that we could seize onto and think about adding dimensions to our understanding of the street. And some of those dimensions are not just time, but they are cultural or they are value laden. And they capture the virtualities or the intangible aspects of streets. So for, by intangible, um, I'll explain that a, a bit more, but uh, we're, we include all objects which we can't touch. So not like, like wood, but things that exist, but you can't touch them. I call them virtualities. I'm sorry to be spending my time first morning with, uh, with, uh, with words and theory, but, but I think it's essential to understand that we now live in a world where intangibles or virtualities are of absolutely central economic and political and um, spiritual importance. They are real, but they're not physical objects. They are ideal, but they're not just ideas. If, um, if our world was made up of just physical objects and ideas, we could easily change our mind and we could change others' minds and we could reach agreement so much, easy, much more easily. But our world is made up of real but intangible things like family, community, nation. All of these things are quite real. They're just not like tabletops or rocks. Another example is the brand. Right? A shoe, a Nike shoe. The shoe is the thing. What is the brand? There's a slogan, just do it. But the brand, Nike, is perhaps best expressed by their logo, by the swoosh. And so you can see the importance of the designer who made that, that swoosh. But also you can see that if you get rid of the shoe, the brand persists. It can go on a hat. So these are intangibles. The brand itself is intangible and it's worth a great deal of money. So it's of economic importance. We live in a world where perhaps our encounter with cyberspace brought our attention back to the importance of the, of the intangible. If we think about reality in this fourfold way, then we can, th we can see that the real is, uh, does not exist, the, the category of what exists, but there are also the, the possible um, and that actualities, the here and now is not the limit of our world, but there are um, ideal elements to it, and we can make this kind of matrix, and I, I think visually and uh, coming out of architecture, I, I tr you know, kind of work through the philosophy books, keeping, making diagrams, and this is what I come up with. So, so after much work through all of those postmoderns and Deleuze and so on that you might have on your desk or your bookshelf, um, this is, this is a, a digested uh, version of it. The virtual is the real and ideal, quite different from abstract concepts such as the possibly ideal uh, or any, any um, um, narrative or fiction we might possibly come up with. And then I also just draw your attention to the actually possible, which we, for which we have a language of statistics, and it's the contribution of the social sciences, which shouldn't be uh, forgotten. We can apply this to streets and to understanding um, places in terms of not just the actual place, the actual place now and the practices of space, as Lefebvre would say, but also the real and ideal qualities of the place, its capacities, its latent qualities, its the heritage and its past elements, which are all layered there. Again, those are different from the narratives that people tell about the space, the abstract, and different from the performativity, and whether it's raining or not today, the actual kind of momentary um, probability of, uh, that we find uh, in the place. I'm happy to come, come back to this. I just want to, want to encourage you to think, in these slides, I've been trying to say, 
that there are these intangible aspects and we need to expand our grasp of reality so we, or we need to expand our understanding of the empirical to include the intangible. And then we need uh, tools for doing that. These are models or frameworks and tools. I've suggested the first one, which is uh, perhaps a topological understanding and that we might just think of it as overdimensioned. So we can go back to our GIS uh, systems and we can add another dimension to capture a set of, of uh, variables that are social or perhaps gender uh, or um, perhaps about heritage. That might allow us to then think a little bit about the aesthetic as something that's performative and as, uh, as ethical rather than driven by moral imper imperatives. So rather than merely being good, um, the aesthetic includes elements of harmony, of, of balance, of getting along and getting by. In that old uh, Greek sense of aesthesis, of what's, what, how we experience together something, rather than simply aesthetic, the, Germ the German tradition of formal um, aesthetic rules. So aesthesis, that what we experience together, the kind of bringing together of a way of performing in a street is really grounded in an ethos of the place. And here context is essential, that kind of co-being of context to bringing together uh, a social order which comes from the bottom. Um, I'm in mean, a Catholic university, you think of, of uh, Moses and the tablets as morals that come from the top, from the mountaintop. This is ethics and aesthetics that come from the bottom, it's coming out uh, in the situation, the situation ethics, if you want, Nicomachean ethics uh, from, from Aristotle. That that's extremely useful when we appro approach the street as it is, because of course streets are so incredibly diverse. So the prosaics of the street that are imminent to experience, uh, I think lend a great deal of interest to design research uh, and to the investigation of actual social interaction that of course is embodied or perhaps uh, put in a car um, and involves um, the sociability or sociable interactions. It allows us to really then uh, integrate the semiotics of gesture and of uh, interpersonal communication, but also understand the small niceties of, of passing or um, this power struggle of, um, oh, I didn't see you, I'm, I'm going right through here anyway. You know, car drivers have mastered that, of not looking at the other person and, and continuing on to, to change lanes or take the place. Um, but those kinds of, of interactions uh, form uh, a kind of street ballet that um, Jane Jacobs, a Canadian uh, journalist and urbanist, or perhaps anti-urbanist, um, argued was at the center of uh, urban life. She said that you know, the city streets, she describes them as a ballet, as a, a dance. She situates her own entry into it. She describes it through the day and as the lights go up at night uh, in a compelling metaphor for interaction and for streets as social centers, which she poses against, at the time, Robert Moses' vision of the street as a transit, um, transportation, not transit, but transportation, car-based access route from which it was necessary to clear people uh, as much as possible. Jane Jacobs' metaphor of the ballet uh, is echoed in the work of Irving Goffman who uh, also describes the ballet of places and the way in which um, he's a, a sociologist and an ethnographer, um, also originally Canadian, um, and I don't know why Canadians are particularly uh, writing about this topic in the 1960s, but a particular interest in the way in which interpersonal um, interaction is carried out in, in movement, 
um, so that there it so that this isn't as much a, a topic that is um, um, phenomenological or something that we can really f should really focus at the level of the individual, but something that is collective, that involves uh, mobilities or moving uh, groups who are navigating and negotiating uh, on the fly, in process. So it's not so much a question of the meaning the individual gains from it, um, but it is something that is elaborated by small groups uh, together and in interaction. This defies some of the methodological um, tools of uh, North American um, social science, which have always focused on the individual. You go with a questionnaire and you can ask, what, what did it mean to you? What did you see? Uh, Goffman points to the importance of it kind of stepping back and this kind of cinematogra cinematographic vision of, of the street. That tradition of the, the sidewalk ballet is inherited. It's, it's a, a metaphor repeated it again and again. It has some limits to it uh, that I'll mention, but David Harvey picks it up um, and others to, to really start to talk about the street as a crucial site uh, where, um, where politics in the end becomes visible. It becomes visible as um, encounter, uh, as negotiation, as collaboration, and as confrontation. The Spanish writer um, Ruiz Martín Delgado in his book El Animal Público uh, says that the street is the country of those with no country moving to this idea of the anonymity of the street, it's the street where every moment since the production and the integration of incompatibles, where the most effective exercises of reflecting about one's own identity can be carried out, and where the notion of political commitment as a consequence of the possibilities of action makes sense, and where social mobilization allows one to know the potential of currents of sympathy and solidarity among strangers. Almost all of those categories of the four aspects of the, of the real, of, 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 of existence, um, come up in, that, um, in this quotation. The materiality of the place, the um, intangibility uh, of the, the social, um, the abstract notions of, um, of, um, of, of politics, uh, and the probabilistic qualities of performance and uh, whether one will find sympathy or hostility uh, on the street. Similarly, Jean-Francois Lyotard, the great French philosopher of postmodernism, of the, the postmodern condition, um, a, a report commissioned in Montreal uh, by the Quebec government to try to understand the, the changing urban rural balance within the province of Quebec. So it's actually a policy report, that short text, Condition of Postmodernity, uh, is worth reading as, as that. Um, and thinking about the urban uh, importance and the influence of Montreal, which is a great multicultural city with uh, hundreds of thousands of Lebanese living in it. Um, think about the influence of that context on the text. He says it requires this situational ethics of the street um, and a kind of, of, um, of aesthetics. Sorry, it's misspelled uh, there, an aesthetics to avoid a, a law-like meta-narrative that becomes an oppressive moral politics. There he is again chaining this idea of a, of a moral politics and law that is universal and good for all times and all places, a kind of a, a vision on the mount that is uh, contrasted with the situational ethics and aesthesis of the street itself. Um, that is probably, that's New York rather than Montreal, I think, but I can imagine it, I can imagine it as Montreal. Um, which button do I push? All right. So cities themselves become identified with, the, with that ethos, with that ethos of the street, uh, with a particular street culture, uh, and they become that 
that way of interaction um, at the level of the city understood as the, it becomes the identity of the city. It becomes a spatialization of the city, a kind of shorthand for understanding, oh, this is the city of, you know, fill in the blank. What is Beirut today? Uh, or what are its suburbs today? Um, this is an, a topic that, this is always changing. What is Paris today? Uh, what is Montreal today? Um, what is um, uh, Antwerp or Bogota today? A lot of this is summed up, I think, in the word tact, which has been poorly explored. And I, I think we could do a lot with the word tact, which in a way summarizes many of these concerns. That there is a, an active, attentive engagement in the form of inattention you know, that is often related to touching. How we touch with our eyes, but how we touch with our bodies or not. How we navigate in the streets. It's a sense of conduct um, and uh, a sense of, of perception. Uh, not only does it distinguish the social sciences and humanities, but I think it distinguishes design from engineering. This is the, the key pivot, pivotal concept between a design solution and an engineered solution. No, no judgment, uh, no value judgment either way. It's just this is the, the distinction um, that allows us to understand what we're doing when we're building as architects a building and when we're putting together um, a um, technical solution for you know, space, space management. Because we all, all know that engineers do a great job um, at it. This idea of ethos, just to give you an example, this, is a, this uh, slide is, um, is uh, Ribera in uh, Salvador de Bahia in, in Brazil, a fantastic um, 1500s uh, city, uh, the found, one of the founding um, centers of, uh, of, uh, of Brazil. Um, the immediacy uh, of this sort of situational ethos is preserved uh, in this huge Afro-Brazilian uh, city um, in, in the Northeast, um, where, where rules are made up on the fly and um, where it is not so much rule governed by empathetic, but, but empathetic. It's, it depends on one's ability to strike a relationship with the other that one encounters um, in order to go, get through everyday life. When you drive, for example, in, in these streets, the, the thumbs up is the essential um, rule of the road is to make eye contact with the other driver and give them a thumbs up that yes, you're going or who, who's gonna go first? That it's negotiated, but the success of your trip, of your encounter, will depend on your ability to make that relationship with each person on the street or, or in the room or in the ice cream place. That it really is, not, the success is not guaranteed. It's not uh, governed by a, a rule or a script um, the way it would be, say, in Canada, um, where you can essentially not make contact much with anyone and treat everybody like a robot. Um, but in this case, it requires a real sensitivity and responsiveness to who's around you. Uh, and that uh, really um, creates a, a local culture for which Salvador has become uh, a famous example. Um, and I recommend it to, to everybody. Um, a kind of merging of so ethos is a kind of emerging of being touched, of touching, and of the medium of touch, of the space between, of that social environment, in short, a kind of topology of, of collective experience. So I want to think about tact as a mark of civility then, and then think about the way in which, as designers, we're often charged with creating streets which would be sites of emancipation. And as sites of emancipation, we often think of ourselves as emancipating people from uh, limitations, rules, and so on. And so you may think, aha, so it's a design for tact. 
The problem with emancipation um, <clears throat> is that it has such an ancient tradition going back with the city perhaps to, to Constantine, where in the holy city you have the kind of union of the promise of redemption together with the physical environment. So we build the city of redemption. Make sense? We build the great city where we will receive emancipation from our barbarian uh, past or our um, moral um, um, limitations and our bodily desires, perhaps. Um, but that tradition, a kind of messi messianic tradition, is always emancipation from. But ultimately, uh, I very interested in uh, Jean-Francois Lyotard's comments on the limits of this, that we always seek emancipation from, but in the end we are always subject to others. And especially in this environment of tact that emphasizes the way in which we are bound up, our fate is bound up with others. We can't easily be emancipated from that. Lyotard says it's bound up in the, the root of the word emancipation, it's mancips. It's I receive my political uh, liberty, my political majority, right? I, I leave the, 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 the it's me in French, right? Mancipum. Um, it's the, the grasp, I escape the grasp of my father of the law. The law and I become a, a, a person, a legal person of my own. I escape my childhood uh, because as children we're, we're subject to the grasp of others. And before we even have the language to explain, things happen to us. Often it's very, very traumatic as a result. We can't explain what's happening, but we have uh, experiences. But we receive from our family, from, from society, we receive language. How do we escape that? And then we receive um, moral and ethical um, ideals. How do we escape those? So, Emancipation is a kind of a fool's dream. And yet the professions, the design professions, such as architecture, are really hitched to this messianic tradition, uh, especially in, in uh, modern uh, planning, that we will deliver that city, the city of emancipation, so that we will create spaces of emancipation, be they the great public squares, or the chaotic marketplaces of liberalism, um, or um, promenades where we will, we will achieve enlightenment through, through beauty, right? You, 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 you get the narrative? So, I mean, it's really easy to, to bite like a fish and then you're, you're stuck on, on that, designing these spaces of emancipation. You can design the great political halls and the, the, um, the, the new capitals of, uh, of ideal government. But that emancipation from is a is got, there's another tradition, and it's the emancipation for. If we turn the word emancipation around and we think we want to create the possibilities to do something, we all know, for example, about the university as a, a site that consecrates a kind of creative freedom, right? It's a kind of consecration of tolerance. And similarly, streets have that in a kind of the small form, you know, petit a, the little form of that. The consecration of this, that sort of freedom makes of the streets not so much a site of emancipation, but opportunity. So that is, is um, uh, my, <coughs> my political translation of this, perhaps. So we're building this kind of world, um, and it as a world of possibility. It's one in which it's a production of space, but there are multiple spaces. And uh, I've done a lot of work on Henri Lefebvre. It's essential to loosen up, I think, and think about the multiple uh, layers and possibilities. My slides just finish with some um, um, presentation, some comments on, on the importance of thinking about the past. For example, the intangible heritage of the street. All this is about the multiplicity of, of the streets, uh, of what is there. It's the way in which the past is real, but it's an intangible presence. And all of these elements, these intangible elements, or these layers, these different dimensions, contribute to the streets as a site of 
uh, opportunity rather than emancipation per se. It's as if <clears throat> in this kind of multidimensional vision or this overdimensioned vision of the street, we have to think about a street as a kind of Escher torqued space, as a non-Euclidean space, one which, like Escher's stair staircase, there's a twist in the space. There's a twist in the air that allows, uh, creates a possibility of doing something that is materially, if not impossible, then unlikely. And uh, every, every school of architecture should have one of these, these uh, stairways, I think, it, just to, uh, to uh, get us out of our Euclidean um, technology, which I've said encloses us still. It's very difficult to understand not only the rubber sheet geometry of stretched spaces. You see the triangle stretched onto the, the globe. I mean, we airplanes fly curves on maps, even though they fly straight lines in, uh, in, um, oh, through the air. It's very difficult for us to make that topological translation just between the flat chart and the curved space. But if we imagine that that is what designers are doing all the time, moving between the multiple layers of reality of, for example, a design uh, group's um, discussion of what they are looking for in a product or in a, um, in a site versus the final project. That sort of process of translation, I think, is an apt uh, metaphor. Do we have time to go a little bit more detail? Okay, so the interesting thing about this, I, I said I was going to borrow some of the language of topology to talk about emancipation, uh, and you might have written down or just simply skipped when I said algebraic topology. It's not to be afraid of. The actual, in, in fact, algebraic topology starts with an urban question. The fascinating thing is the mayor wrote to, to Leonard Oler in um, 1736, the, the citizens had a question how to get about, how to go on a stroll around across the bridges of their city without crossing each bridge once. Once, Here's the diagram. You can try it if you have a, 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 a pen and paper. You can try it to draw a line so you, you could start at, say, little A and go over to little C and over to little d and across to b and then f and then c is that c or is that an e in there you know, you, you end up uh, in this beautiful um, medieval town um, which was uh, Immanuel Kant worked and is buried there today in the cathedral I recommend you can go there and try an Olarian an Olarian walk Let's, let's start at F. We go to F, to E, to D, to C. Oh, we have to cross this again. Let's try, try with B. B to D over to C to A. You could come back here, I guess, and avoid B, cross F and C, but you have one left. So Oler proves that you, uh, 